my body will grow old. My mind may fade. Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran jazz vocalist and songwriter Lois DeLoge. We caught up with her to discuss a new album that was fueled by living through the COVID-19 era. It's the 2024 CD, Love Always. She marks 30 years in music with her new recording and is consistently recognized internationally for her rich contralto voice, thought-provoking lyrics, and distinctive blend of jazz, folk, blues and spirituals over the years she has shared the stage with the likes of legends ellis marsalis arturo sandoval and dr billy taylor amongst others we cover some great ground here enjoy thank you so much for taking a minute out for neon jazz today i'm looking forward to talking about love always and your history and music so thank you oh thank you for having me it's just my pleasure so before we get into the new album I want to know, we're getting on the four-year anniversary of this pandemic. How did you survive the COVID pandemic, and how did it ultimately change you? Oh, Joe, thank you for that question. In fact, a lot of the music on Love Always was written, written during the pandemic. I survived fairly well, considering everything that happened to all of us. Um, in fact, the day we realized that we were going into lockdown, I was coming home from Greensboro, North Carolina, which is only an hour away. My daughter-in-law had had my first grandchild. We now have, have two. So this was like the very first week of March. Uh, Faith was born a year ago yesterday, February 21st. So I'd gone up to take my grandma duty and all the world was going into uh, panic. I remember stopping at a store on the way back from Greensboro to Durham. This is when you could not find alcohol or, um, you know, disinfectant wipes in the store. And something went off in my brain this, that said, this is different. Maybe I should be worried. Uh, the good news is, though, that... Um, for my family, we survived okay over the last four years. Uh, one of the tunes on the CD, Love Always, called 41st Cousins, was written for my cousin Barbara Drew, who lived in Brooklyn, and she was an early victim of COVID pre-vaccines. Um, her daughter dropped her at the hospital, I'm sure thinking she would see her again, uh, and never did. Um, I give that as an example of the range of emotions we all just endured from fear to um, moments of joy uh, during COVID, but we survived. We, I'm very fortunate that I live in an area where, you know, I'm in walking distance to people I know and love. And so I had a, a community during COVID. Um, so I'll, I'll just stop there. It, it's been a lot for all of us. And I'm just so um, grateful that we're now beginning to emerge and move about in the world in ways that at least somehow resemble what we saw before. Yeah. And and I know that during that time, I really amped up my interviews with musicians and it was, it got to the point, especially with people that lived in Brooklyn and in and, and New York, where it was getting really hard because, you know, when you live in apartment dwellings like that, you can only play a horn for so long. You can only make that much noise before the whole novelty of it wears off. So to see new albums and to see the outgrowth. And I kept thinking during that time, the amount of creativity that's incubated and going to come out after this is amazing. And this, our conversation now is kind of a testament to, to that notion um, and, and it's aptly named, the album's aptly named. So I'm curious, at the end of the day, this creation, this outgrowth of this period we went through, what are you ultimately hoping a listener gets from this? I hope that a listener gets from this a sense of hope, of faith, of resilience, of feeling okay and being okay with telling your story your way, communicating in the world and moving around in the world uh, in ways that reflect who you are, um, what you came from. A lot of this music to me is about documenting a life and heritage. 
Um, I mentioned in an interview a few days ago that my father, Walter DeLote Sr., passed away in December of 2022 at the ripe old age of 98. With his passing, it was an end of an era in my family because I am now uh, an elder. Uh, literally, and I'm embracing my role as an elder in the family, in the true sense of the word. And so for me, the music in particular is a way of imparting our history um, as a family, as a society, uh, and, and passing it on. So there are any number of things. And more than anything else, I just hope people can find something they connect with and identify with. Um, I don't have overly lofty goals for it. Uh, music is my way of processing the world and being in the world. Um, and so I hope others just glean some from it, something from it that might be useful to them. So speaking of that legacy, uh, how did all of this begin for you? Tell me where you were born and raised. How did these roots and seeds of not only song, but, but jazz become your life and your passion? I was raised in Northampton County, North Carolina, in a town called Margaretsville. And Joe, the population is 500. That's when everybody's home. Um, it's a rural farm community. Well, in years past, it was a rural farm community. I uh, don't mean to paint an idyllic, you know, idyllic uh, picture of it, but it really was wonderful growing up on the land and being of the land and, you know, lots of fresh air. And we, we my dad was a tradesman, a carpenter and a brick mason. My I'm again, I'm seventh of 10 children. So my mom worked full time at home <laughs> all day, every day, had lots of older siblings who, um, you know, helped to raise me. So we lived in just one of those communities where we took care of each other, um, far from perfect, but we had a deep sense of, of, of community in terms of um being responsible and accountable to each other, um, again, being accountable to the land and to the earth. We were uh, conserving water way before it became popular with other people. We recycled and upcycled from the time we were kids. Um, so it was um, a rural upbringing that just taught us a, taught me a lot about being in the world. And certainly seven, being the seventh of 10 children, I'll tell folks now, you can't hurt my feelings because, you know, I'm from a big family. You, you can't call me a name. I haven't already been called. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sort of from that. A lot of our community life revolved around the church because it particularly in African-American communities and lots of communities, uh, faith um, it's what anchored us in the community. Uh, so I joined the choir at a very early age, maybe seven, eight, nine years old, and was quickly identified as somebody who had some talent. So, you know, um, even now, I don't get upset when people, you know, critique my singing. I mean, if I pass muster for the elders of my church when I was nine or 10 years old, then I'm not trying to live up to anybody else's expectations. So music has always been just a part of, of my family and my siblings had a band when I was too young to be part of that band. They did soul, pop, rock. You know, we listened to everything in the household, everything, you know, hard rock, country, uh, blues. In my home right now, I have a Victrola, which was a gift from the woman who lived across the road, Miss Rosalie. And uh, that's one of the things that I cherish. So we would put the old big, you know, 78s on and, and play those records. So music has always been part of, of, of my physical environment. So what was the first live show, whether jazz or otherwise, that you saw that blew you away that made you think, I want to be on that stage one day? <laughs> <laughs> People find it unexpected when I say the first big, so there are two, two, two things here. Um. One is the first real live show I went to, um, big live show, was the Spectrum in Philadelphia in 1973 with my older brothers. No, maybe it was 74. Older brothers. We saw, I think it was Bad Company and Edgar Winter Group. Wow. It was a huge, massive concert because my brother was into rock and he was uh, into rock guitar. Uh, but before that, we had a lot of friends in my small community who were in bands. So live music was common as you, you know, you probably younger than I am, but in the late sixties, early set, well, through the seventies, most of the performances we went to, they were live bands. 
uh, dance bands or just music for listening. So um, I would say the first live music was maybe that was out of church. You know, people underestimate the power of live music in the church. Um, but um, probably in my early preteen years, and that was in my community, as well as um, that big concert in Philadelphia, which was life changing. However, I'll note, songwriting has always been my sweet, happy place. Uh, I'm so fortunate that I get to sing, but being on the stage singing and performing, I love it. But the first love is the writing and the behind the scenes work. So you've been at this for a little while. You clearly love it. It's your it's your career. What do you like the best about being a professional musician? What gets you up every day and motivates you? I would say what gets me up and motivates me is just the possibilities of engaging in the world through the arts, particularly through music. It's the sound, it's the sights. I have lots of friends and who are who, who are creatives. Um, whether you're creating a soundscape with music or whether you're listening to the rhythm of nature. Um, and then I'm always thinking about how I can incorporate that into something I'm doing. I might hear a phrase on on the radio or on TV, or I may see a color that then sparks some um, word or some note in my ear that then might become part of a song. Um, I, I think that for me, creativity, particularly music, it's just integrated into who I am and everything that I do. I wouldn't say that it's in one particular space. There are times when I really do woodshed though. You know, I may go for weeks and just ruminate or think about particular sounds or phrases before I sit down at the piano and start trying to transform that into uh, a musical idea. So at the end of the day, why do you love jazz? The improvisational nature of jazz. And I would say jazz certainly is on the continuum of um, Black music, African-American music. Um, it's the improvisational nature of jazz. The fact that there is this common repertoire, a commonality in terms of how it's anchored um, from a, a theory perspective, but then the fact that there, there is an opportunity to reinterpret it or to add a coda or to rephrase or reframe uh, notes or lyrics that have already been put on paper. Um, it just presents so many opportunities to find yourself in it um, and to appreciate it. Um, I think that's really what draws me most to jazz. I was listening to Sonny Rollins, The Bridge, just this morning um, I, and thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, to have been created, what, 50 years ago, whenever it was, uh, it's as fresh and beautiful to, and complex today as it was when it was first made. The same thing when I listen to Equinox, you know, Coltrane or to um, any classic tune. And, 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 and again, when I'm listening to um, modern day artists or people that I love today, I often think about whether it's a Kenny Garrett or, or whomever, um, that it's all on that continuum. And the quality of it is just, um, just excellent. So let's say you get into a time machine and you could go back in the annals of jazz and see one live performance with your own eyes. Where are you going? Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Where am I going? Over the last few weeks, I've been looking back at a number of performances, and I think it was Abby Lincoln and Max Roach when they were at, I believe, Hampton University. 
and the fact that they were there with students during a time when um, a little bit of a tumultuous time, uh, I, I would love to be able to, to be live there. Um, that, that kind of setting. Uh, or I would love to go back to uh, Newport when Mahalia Jackson was there among the greats. Again, a lot of these, it's in the 50s and the um, the 60s. Uh, not looking at it through rose-colored glasses, but just knowing how I feel about it now, being able to be in the seat or near the stage or you know, uh, sitting on the lawn to absorb that in my own spirit and with my own ears, I, I'd love to be able to do that. So Lois, at the end of the day, everyone has a perception of you, family, friends, fans, but you ultimately run the show. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? Wow. That's a question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm going to use some words that sound a little cliche, but it's true. But they ring true for me. And that's authentic. I try to be the same person no matter what setting I am in, whether I'm with my siblings back and sitting on the front porch in Margaretsville, my hometown, or whether I am in a setting in here in Durham, or whether I'm in New York in an audience listening to someone else or it just um, authentic. A person who loves to be with people, who loves to create. I'm also very curious. Um, I'm just curious about what other people enjoy and what they find fascinating. I love doing what you're doing right now, which is sitting on the other side of the, of the mic, asking other people about what interests them. My husband and I co-hosted a jazz radio show called Sunday Evening Classics for about four years on WNCU. I loved it when I got to inter interview uh, Dee Dee Bridgewater or, um, you know, or uh, Diane Reeves or Ed Thigpen or Billy Taylor to talk with them about their experiences. So I'm a person who's just very curious um, because that's my way of connecting uh, is finding out what other people enjoy and what is meaningful to them. So I would say I'm curious and I'm authentic and hopefully no matter where you run into me, I'm going to be or if I'm on the stage, I'm the same. I'm not a person with a lot of pretense and, you know, and, and flair. I, I am just who I am. And I hope folks accept me for what I am and who I am and what I stand for, which is truth and, um, and helping people find their own power. That's so well said. And my final question to you with all of these names that you've had the chance to share the stage with, Ellis Marsalis, Arturo Sandoval, Dr. Billy Taylor, what did, what have you learned from the legends and luminaries that you in turn try to pass on to the younger generations? They are humble people, just humble people who are immersed in the world and in their art and they are serious about it. Um, I think they take their art seriously, but to a person, um, the folks you've just named, they are just, were many are now ancestors, loving folks who used music and the arts as a way to connect with their own humanity and to connect other humans to them, to each other. Um, so I would say if any, among the lessons I took away from them, it really would be things like, um, be genuine, do things from your core, do them well. Um, if you're going to do, uh, or be a musician, don't play at it, be serious about it. Um, so, so those are some of the lessons I think I would take, but all of them were just genuinely nice people. Uh, who were there and who were open um, to learning themselves and always learning, always, always being open to learning uh, something new 
and being interested in what other artists are doing uh, with their craft or within their spaces. So Lois, the new album, Love Always, I urge everyone to go out and get it. Where's the best place to pick this up? Maybe learn about live shows, anything else in your world where the good business, where can they go? The good business, go to amazon.com. If you want the physical CD, it's available. And I hope folks will get the physical CD. I know that, you know, for many of us now don't have CDs players in our cars, but I love the, the actual artifacts. <laughs> um, uh, you, um, it's going to be streaming on all platforms beginning March 15th. Uh, you can check my website, loisdeloach.com, L-O-I-S-D-E-L-O-A-T-C-H.com um, for other ways to access the music. But, but you pretty much will be able to get it everywhere uh, soon, the individual tracks. Um, but for now, you can go to amazon.com or my website. And um, yeah, so check check me out. Excellent, Lois. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your story and best of luck with the release and everything else that comes your way. Thank you very much. And hopefully we can stay in touch, Joe. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and minds in Durham, North Carolina, Kansas City, and spots all over the world giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Lois for all that good energy. If you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. I have enduring faith, enduring love, my soul remembers. Neon Jazz.